So I think of it as behavioral change at scale that produces business outcomes. And the reason why I peg it there is because the, it means that the hardest parts of creating organizational change are the spreading new behavior. So it's not about initiating change. Like, again, like I, I worked in a lot of like innovation labs and accelerators where like getting things started took effort, but it wasn't the hardest part. It was about how do you spread new behaviors? How do you spread those ideas inside the organization, diffuse them across like silos and, and teams? And the other challenges is how do you sustain change long enough to actually have an effect on business outcomes? Employer branding is absolutely a team sport. You can't do it by yourself. Or at least if you try, you're not gonna get very far. Part of employer brand's job is to rally as many advocates, as many stakeholders, as many allies as possible to say, we need to change not just the way we talk to candidates, but how we present the entire company to candidates, and that means making real organizational change. So when it comes to organizational change, we got to talk to an expert. Now, Bud Cadell is not a name you might know, but I promise you that you really should. Uh, I ran into his work 10 years ago, back when he was a digital strategist, back when I was a digital strategist, and he wrote one of the best slideshows on what is digital strategy. Now, bear in mind, again, 10 years ago, a whole different lifetime ago. Since then, he's become obsessed with how organizations, how companies change themselves to become more effective. He's thrown out a lot of literature, the stuff that we learned in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, and said, no, no, no. In a world where individuals have a lot of power, they have a lot of choice in where they work, developing an organization and changing the organization to fit takes a lot of work. In fact, it takes very specific work. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Bud Cadell is incredibly smart and knowledgeable about this subject. His company, Nobel Collective, change is one of those things that everybody says they want, but almost nobody actually wants to do. Right? Nobody actually wants to change. They just want change to happen. So in a way, he's something of a miracle worker because he helps organizations and companies actually change from the inside. And trust me, if you've ever been in that kind of process and know how often this sort of thing fails, you know, miracle worker is not overstating it. So I hope you enjoy this conversation with Bud Cadell. I am here with Bud Cadell, uh, who is someone I have been reading for way longer than I care to admit. The very first thing I ran into of yours was the Digital Strategy 101 before I got into employer branding. So that is a bit of a blast from the past. So if you Google that, still worth reading. I've checked it out recently. Still worth reading. So that that is uh, that that's less longevity right there. Yeah, that means I'm old. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what you're talking about. What that? What, what must that be like? Uh, Bud Cadell is the founder and CEO of Nobel. No, Noble or Nobel? Nobel, but as long as you talk about us, you can call us whatever you want. Exactly. I get how that goes. Uh, it, or, it, he's focused on organizational change, which is a deeply fascinating subject, if for no other reason than I failed my organizational development class in college. It was my very last class. We don't have to get into it. Um, but it's it's a fascinating subject. Like I love reading about it, but I also know that I know about 1% of, of what people like Bud know. So that's why I've invited Bud in to say, this is how change really happens in organizations. And if we're really serious about making change and making talent acquisition better, that's not a solo sport. That's very much a team sport that involves leadership and, and, and hiring managers and recruiters and sourcers and coordinators and all the rest. And that means understanding organizations. So, but I'm so thrilled to have you on. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. Uh, for the benefit of everybody, besides, you know, old PowerPoint decks that seems to linger on the internet, you know, forever and ever, can you introduce yourself uh, or how do you introduce yourself at parties, I guess, assuming people oh are still God. go to parties? Uh, well, I say I'm a cobbler just because I don't want to get into this whole thing. Uh, like I'm Daniel Day-Lewis. But yeah. the the like the quick background is, look, I was a failed software developer who then found my, like, like many consultants, found myself in consulting. Uh, and I was a self-loathing management consultant, uh, built a lot of innovation labs and accelerators inside large companies. Are, are um, those in quotes? Are you mentally putting, applying quotes to accelerators and innovation labs? Oh, well, yeah. Quotes around everything here. Um, <laughs> you know, and very, very earnest people trying to do new things in organizations and putting lots of shine and polish on them. And they all failed just like insanely like they were just like just colossal failures yeah and had to take a very big look back at my life in 2008 because i was 
you know, I had a sick family member. I had to take a year off work. I was staying in a retirement community in Florida, Jacksonville, Florida, and looking around at like the devastation of the housing crisis and looking around at my own work and just everything, you know, looking at my own failures, looking around at like overgrown lawns. I don't know, something hit me and I was like, I'm solving the wrong problem. The work I've been doing in my life is not, doesn't give me a lot of meaning and impact. I've got to do something different. I've got to zone in on what's stopping organizations from being able to change. And it doesn't look like, you know, this song and dance man that I am of like going into organizations with these polished decks, with these like clever cat photos and these artisanal font choices and trying to, you know, pitch them on ideas that are just retreaded ideas they've seen other places, or there are the same ideas that other people are already pitching inside the organization. I'm just the shiny penny mm -hmm. that that's pitching that idea. It, it's got to look different. And I, you know, I didn't, you know, study organizational design or development in college. I studied medieval literature. So I had to basically put myself through, I spent a year, there was an entire wall of the room I was in that was like every book I could find on every cur curriculum I could find um, on every major like course uh, on organizational mm -hmm. development um, and complexity science at the same time. because that was also oh. another like thing I was obsessed with at the same time, which really, really just sort of intersected each other beautifully, I found. Um, and I just read every textbook I could talk. I like phoned up experts. I emailed experts just to ask them questions about it. And then I just started, you know, when I was able to start this company a few years later, I just hired everyone who's smarter than me and tried to listen to them about the right way to create change inside or and try to inside organizations. And it looked just very different than um, I had been doing it before. Yeah. That's so, a really, really long time. So at this point at parties, everyone's gone. Um, I'm by myself. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the, the scotch is just for you now. It's a, it's, it's all yeah, for you. It's yeah. perfect. Um, just be, and, and as a tangent, what were like your favorite books? Like what were the ones that made you say, okay, this is really changing my thinking on how organizations, organizations work. The ones that have stuck with me over the years is kind of a funny mix. Like, you know, mm -hmm. obviously there was just a bunch of foundational knowledge. I mean, the, all the classic textbooks were important, but the ones that have stuck with me, there's a book a long, long time ago called the fractal organization. Mm -hmm. There's all the like ideas in there that, are still like very pie in the sky, but there was like some, some grounding ideas in that book about how you create teams that have to work together. Um, very interesting book. I think Donnell Meadows, like thinking in systems has always stuck one. with me. Like that one's like for the longest time I made all new hires read that book. Also weirdly at the same time, the other book I made everyone read was full catastrophe living by John Kabat-Zinn. I was like wow. to do the work that we do, you have to keep yourself like at a place where you know, you have some resilience, like the kind of work that in the way that we deliver it, because we're not the deck deliverers anymore. We're mm -hmm. like doing constant coactive coaching and you have to take care of yourself to do it. And you have to have the like wherewithal to pull yourself out of a situation when you're like, I'm not at my best. I can't do this work right now. And you have to feel it within your body. And it's like, it's got to be a personal thing. Like I can't own that as your employer. Yeah. I can own like how much work I'm, I'm putting on your shoulders, but otherwise you have to own what's going on in your own skull. Wow. Yeah. So you're talking psychology, sociology, uh, systems thinking, and I'm a big systems person myself. Uh, first time I read Peter Senji, I was like, oh, this explains so yeah. much. What was, how, why was I not told? Like that was just this kind of like lightning moment for me. And that kind of got me to system stuff. Yeah. And Complexity by uh, Mitchell Waldrop, I think mm -hmm. was a book at the time. Like it described like the early genesis of complexity science, which was a bunch of like, oh, a, like a biologist and an economist. And a physicist sat at a lunch table together and they're like, why do all of our sciences have these things in common? What's the thing underneath all of this? Yeah. That was fascinating to me. Um, yeah. And, you know, and then like, you know, there's like classic literature, like there's, again, we steal from lots and lots of places like Cotter. Like there's a lot of good stuff in there. It, I don't think it's right for all domains. I especially don't think it's right for a lot of like the agile environments we see now, but there's still like great ideas in there that can be applied in other places. So, yeah, there's, there's, there's great stuff there. There's just a lot for me to learn as someone who came from the outside and try to keep that mindset all the time. Yeah. The but right now, like sitting next to me, I have uh, Werner Herzog's Every Man for Himself and God Against All. Doesn't and everybody? Then, <laughs> trying, trying to learn from that crazy, <laughs> crazy, crazy person. And then the bear came for me. Okay, that's great. That's great, Werner. Yeah. Thanks, thanks so much. I yeah. feel like we're all trying to like, you know, drag a ship up a mountain. 
um, and doing what we do. So I feel like there's a lot of lessons. To there are. Learn. There's a lot of parallels. Um, okay. So ostensibly you came in first as a consultant, razzle dazzle deck wielding man. And then now as an organization trying to kind of get embedded inside a company in the service of creating change. Yeah. I live in a world where so many of our terms are poorly defined, like strategy and brand and EVP. Like there's so much innovation, all those things are poorly defined. So I, I want to start simple. What does change? What does change mean to you? And what does change mean in organizational design? So I think of it as behavioral change at scale that produces business outcomes. And the reason why I peg it there is because the, it means that the hardest parts of creating organizational change are the spreading new behaviors. So it's not about initiating change. Like, again, like I, I worked in a lot of like innovation labs and accelerators where like getting things started took effort, but it wasn't the hardest part. It was about how do you spread new behaviors? How do you spread those ideas inside the organization, diffuse them across like silos and, and teams. Mm -hmm. And the other challenges is how do you sustain change long enough to actually have an effect on business mm -hmm. outcomes? Like that is the other like big part of the complexity of our work because so often clients want to know like, well, how do you measure that in terms of like, when does this start to impact sales? And like, the question is like, how, if you can sustain the behavior long enough, we can start to measure those things. But like, if you're asking me like, you know, can I, you know, pour a garden hose out and how's it going to affect like the rain next fall? Like I, like that's what you're asking at the time. Yeah. yeah. Bad metaphor, but it really does focus our challenge on like, you know, how do we spread behaviors across the institution and how do we sustain them long enough so that we can start to measure those like long-term knock-on effects that they're looking for. Yeah. Is there like a flavor of the month kind of feeling like, Ooh, agile. Ooh, you know, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's fast company wrote this Harvard business review wrote that we're like, Oh, that's what we're going to do. And some executive gets a hair up some sort of orifice of some sort and says, that's what we're going to do. And for a very brief period of time, it's the most important thing, but everybody kind of knows really, is this, is this what we're going to do? Are we committed to it? So I like this idea of separating the initiation and from the launch longer execution. Yeah, it's strategy of the month club. Like that happens all the time. I mean, the one nice thing about COVID was it, it like kept executives out of airports. So they, couldn't <laughs> pick up, they couldn't pick up that book. Um, and, and so other Air, airports is super spreader of strategy of the month clubs. I like that. I like that. A lot. Yeah, like, oh, yeah, like, oh, those fucking books. Um, Simon Sinek and all those folks. It's just the other thing that would always be a challenge is actually like you'd have a really successful executive and they get moved too quickly. Like they oh. wouldn't have enough time to really build on those, those programs and those platforms. And they were like, Oh, they just succeeded. Let's move that team on. We've seen that so often. Um, and that was actually like a challenge in our early engagements at Nobel. We'd have like a huge effect within say like a, a marketing organization and with the CMO and then the CEO, because we didn't do a good enough job in our early years on the political game of change, mm -hmm. they would either like the CEO would get bored and kind of like shake the etch a sketch just because like we went to can or like we did something, you know, like something would happen and they weren't as wedded to the work. And that CMO would either be moved on because, you know, their tenure is so short yeah, or something like else would happen in the, inside the organization. It would just get thrown for a loop. And so like trying to maintain the cohesion of that change long enough so that we could point to like, okay, now you're seeing the impact in stores. Now you're seeing the impact of, of like, you know, in theaters, we're working with entertainment clients and things like that. It just takes, like, we have to help them understand that we're looking at like a 12 or 18 month or 24 month cycle to see that change. So what happens? So that was kind of my question of what's the timeline, but what happens at the end of that cycle? Do you kind of go nailed it? And then you kind of find something else or do you say, okay, now that we've proven it, now we have to more deeply embed it and make it part of the culture of the DNA or what have you. For us, it's about, you know, you know, we're an outside consultancy. So our mission is always to make ourselves redundant. So our big mission at the end is to like, we call it our equip phase, which is to equip the client to not need us so that wow. we are building their internal change capabilities, whether that looks like, and we kind of have two different paths and we try to have this conversation in the first few months of an engagement, which is like, okay, eventually we want to go and you want us to leave. Do you want to end up with more of a center of excellence for this capability moving forward? And maybe that lives within like your existing OD team or HR, or do you want more of a community of practice model that we leave you with, which is like, 
and, and oftentimes through our work, we already build a community practice of people who are like trying to make change. Like we do a lot of like what we call uh, squads through the work where we're like, have we have like safe to fail teams who are iterating upon processes and things like that. We're training them in how to do that. And we're like, we can leave you with a community of practice, like muscle at the end, but it's on you still to like convene that muscle and to keep it like, you know, strong through the process. That's the downside of that, that yeah. option, which is like someone still has to be convening and activating that, that group of people when we're gone. Yeah. So it has, so it has to be invested in over time. Yeah. yeah. And a COE too, right? COEs can like become too isolated and like too fixated on, you know, building up just their like set of tools without actually deploying them and learning from what's happening in the organization. Where is the intersection or how do you see the intersection between organizational change and culture change? Because I can yeah. see either a lot of overlap or no overlap, depending on how you draw those lines. I mean, to me, it's the same thing. I mean, I, like, and I'm, I'm a bit reductive here. Like I think people on my own team would, um, would beat me up on this a little bit, but to me, I, I just need to distill everything down to behavior change because I think we are ultimately confused in our organizations and we kind of like swirl around the drain in our conversations about like, what, what's the change we're trying to produce. And I need it to be observable behavior. Like I need to understand what are you asking people to do differently? Like with their hands or their fingers as they type, like, what is the thing that I can observe that is changed? And like, and is it a set of behaviors that I'm extinguishing in the organization? Is it a set of behaviors that I'm asking people to adopt? Um, and like, I need to focus there. And so then what's the outcome that that is hopefully producing? Like, what's the hypothesis that sits between that behavior change and the outcome that you're looking for? And then I, whatever that is, you know, then I can play in that space. But otherwise I feel like we, we end up in these semantic, uh, chases with one another where like we're just in meetings after meetings at you know and i need to understand like okay help me understand the outcomes that you want and then help me understand the observable behavior changes that you think will produce those outcomes and then we'll go chase that all day every day with you um, but otherwise i feel like you know we get confused we end up in these like the briefs just get confused and confused um, and then also it's like who does this live with becomes you know you know you know, a, a big question and, and, and that's important, but at the same time, you know, ultimately like who is going to drive the work, you know, has a lot to do with like also where the power lives in the organization. I, I laugh because it, you could start a fight with any three employer branders by asking them, where should employer brand live? And then just kind of walk away. It's the grenade you throw <laughs> in the room and just kind of go, Asta, right? it's all over. And I, it's, it's such a weird conversation I think to have because I think it's one, there is no right answer because every business is organized and structured differently yeah. and different power centers and different focuses. And, uh, and to say that there's one way of doing it is so kind of myopic in terms of look, businesses are incredibly complex and they should be flexible to meet whatever need they, or whatever demand they need to meet. Yeah. It just, it does say a lot though, where it ends up living and, and how much it can actually tackle. And yeah. it says a lot about the, the value of it and, and what you're trying to do. So that's a big question for us is like, okay, where is it living and how much power actually resides in that group? And, and what are you hoping to achieve with it? And, you know, at the end of the day too, like, are you just honest about like the brief that you've handed over to them? Mm -hmm. Or is this, you know, like if you, if you've given it to a team that doesn't have a lot of power, but you've given them a huge amount of, of responsibility or big outcome to go produce, like what, what are we doing here? Like, can we have an honest conversation together about what you're trying to achieve? Quick question. If you could increase the offer acceptance rate by 20%, what would that be worth? Or maybe get 10% more prospects responding to your recruiters, what would that be worth? Or lowering your ad spend and your agency spend by 15, 20%, what would that be worth? I'm gonna bet it's worth a lot more than $1,500 a month. And that's how much it costs to build an employer brand, especially when you treat it as a subscription or employer brand as a service. If you want to learn more about how you can make these kinds of impacts almost immediately, check out employerbrandlabs.com. That's employerbrandlabs.com. All right, let's get back to the podcast. I love that you brought your frame of focus, your perspective down to behaviors, observable behaviors. I am always blown away by the number of people who are experts in culture who 
think of culture as what people think. It's like, I don't care what they think. It's what are yeah. they doing? And, and, you know, call it the, the, the choices they make when there's no authority in the room. That's fine. But ultimately it's just about what are the behaviors when there's no other guidance whatsoever? What, what are they doing when there's nobody there? And I think that's incredibly powerful. Yeah. And we just, again, one of the things I think that makes us different and people can argue with us about is that we fundamentally just don't believe that attitudes change behaviors. We believe that behaviors change attitudes. Yeah. And like, we go, we go back to like the, you know, smoking cessation, right? Like all the PSAs in the world that tell you smoking is bad yeah. impacts some people, but not the broader audience. It's the patch that allows you to change your behavior. It's, it makes it easier to quit. It gives you the, the ability to make it like it, it lowers I mean the, the hurdle to it, like, you know, it lowers the amount of friction to do it. So that's what we look for in our work of, you know, let's, let's lower all the barriers we possibly can to change that behavior and focus there and focus less on like trying to amp people's motivation because so often in any sort of change regime, the very first step is like to hang the fucking mission accomplished bear, like <laughs> banner and go like, this is the big thing we're going to do together. Rah, 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 like get the cheerleading squad out. And all that typically does inside organizations. And this is like very well researched is like increased skepticism and cynicism yep. and cynicism is viral inside organizations because your cynics are typically the most connected people inside the organization. And yes. they think they're doing like a public good too. Like it's a cynicism is a moral reaction. So they think that they're warning you of like, Oh, I've heard this before. It's bullshit. And I'm protecting you. So don't pay attention to this thing. They need, they're like Paul Revere running around telling people like, pay no attention to this. This is a lie. Mm -hmm. And so all you're doing is like spreading cynicism and skepticism in the organization by making that your first move versus, you know, really first just focusing on, you know, what behaviors you want to change. How do you like make people more able to change those behaviors? And then when you have actual evidence of people changing their behaviors, then you start that's when we engage things like communications and really we're just like telling the story of, of positive deviance in the org or bright spots and things like that. That's like when we kick in our comms activities. Yeah. So one of the things that I think my listeners will be thinking about is, okay, so if we're building an organization and how you talk about it and the behaviors that come from it or, or expected in it, we need to communicate that externally to say, we want the people who want this, right? We don't just want people who can, code that thing or be a nurse, but you want to be a particular kind of coder and a particular kind of nurse who wants collaboration or competition or whatever that thing is that, is, you know, how you're structuring this idea. Where does that fit in your model? I presume it's towards the end, but you know, I, you know, you know it better than I do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've done quite a bit of EVP work. I think the, you know, I'm always conscious of Ensuring that the environment that you're you're about to invite people into is at least fertile for those new behaviors, mm -hmm. right? That you have at least systems that aren't going to outright reject those those folks in that place. I remember we interviewed someone at Facebook once in their um, talent acquisition team, and they're like, "Oh, in our onboarding program, we always tell one positive lie. Like if we're trying to change the culture." to be more like we're trying to focus more on documentation. We always tell people in onboarding, oh, people here care a lot about documentation. And I was like, okay, I guess that's one way that you can start to change the culture. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, I'm like, oh, if it's working for you, I don't know. I was like, maybe that's just a clever idea that actually isn't having impact. But <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, a, that's, I tip that's an idea that's sitting on a, on a boat that's already rising high and saying, oh, our idea made it happen. No, maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's always, it's always stuck in my head. Um, but, you know, I always think about like, is the, is the ground fertile for those to tell that external story yet? And again, do the people inside see that story being told outside and it just triggers that skepticism and that cynicism? Mm -hmm. Like how authentic is that story yet? Um, is something that I think you really have to interrogate and, you know, it's like clean up your house before you start to invite other folks. And in. it doesn't have to, again, doesn't have to be pure or perfect. It just has to pass like the sniff test yeah. of like, is that complete BS or not? Yeah. Do you have a, 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 a regular model of change that you go to, to say, okay, every company starts, you know, in a certain spot and we want to get them to this spot. What are the stages or what are the things you think about in that process? Yeah, we have our, you know, like every other consulting company, we have our process and we've like beaten it up over the years and we kind of arrived there because it's the model that works. We've tried so many different ways and really that's what 
change is like we're operating in complex systems. Like people are very messy. Yeah. And all you're really trying to do, you're throwing a lot of different things at the wall and seeing what sticks and, and iterating on it. Like people, there's no, anytime you see like a completely linear model, just question it and get really worried about it because there's no, that's just not how human beings work. And especially that's not how human beings work together. Yeah. But our process is like, we start with what we call orient and all we're trying to do, like, it's not a very long lengthy discovery process. We don't believe that you can like talk to everyone in the organization and map an organization. One, we don't, I don't believe anyone in a one-on-one, -on -one. like everyone's telling me, you know, I'm trying to build a rapport, but I also assume people are doing a lot of stuff in that meeting. They're like scared because I'm an outside consultant mm -hmm. and they're trying to, they're trying to keep their jobs. Yeah. Um, they're trying to like, you know, groom their identity. They're trying to get information out of me. So like, there's a bunch of stuff happening in a one-on-one that isn't like actual information coming back at me. That's useful. Um, so our process is really just trying to understand like outcomes wise, where does the organization think it wants to head? So like, we're just trying to get to simple, like from two statements, like okay. we want to move like from disordered processes to clear more ordered processes, or we want to move like from, um, you know, growth at any cost to yada, 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 yeah. whatever those are. And so they're measurable. We have some idea of how we might measure that in a future state. We have some, some hypotheses of what like behaviors might be underneath that, but it's a very fast process okay. and they're very bad answers. It's like the idea is like to get to like a very bad first draft of like where we think the organization wants to go. It's very directional. That's why mm -hmm. it's called Orient. Like, oh, mm -hmm. we think we want to go East. Then we move through like what we call an align phase. We're just bringing together like senior stakeholders and like political influencers inside the organization together to test those hypotheses. And we just, we're trying to align people of like, do we think this is where we want to go? And what ideas do you have for like how we could get there? What ideas have you been sitting on? Like, what are like, you know, we also invite people to play devil's advocate where we like literally hand roll cards out. We're like, you have to go beat this up and tell us why this is dumb and invite people to just participate in it because we want them to put their thumbprint on it. Huh. and feel like it, they, it was their change that they designed all throughout the organization. It's a very, it's a political step as yeah. much as it is anything else. And then we kind of move into this like, like two lane process of change. Like we call it fail safe and safe to fail. Fail safe changes are changes you mostly have to get right the first go, like big reorgs, big systems implementations. You just don't have the benefit of like, you can't iterate over and over on them. Um, and we are very careful when we do those, like, you know, reorgs are never our first step because mm. they're costly. You mostly get them wrong until you know the organization they're overused as an intervention. Like every new leader is like, we got a reorg and ours we're like, do you understand how the team works yet before you yeah. start to do that? The more, the place we tend to start is this safe to fail domain, which is around like process ways of working rituals. And that's when we are like, you know, let's start with something. We work with a big entertainment studio. We're like, give us your worst film next year we know like the one you you're not expecting to like do well um and let's experiment okay, on it radically. go ahead <laughs> <laughs> let's experiment on it radically and you know and learn from that and kind of like you know and build a crop we built like a completely new cross-functional way of working on that they iterated on that that became like the de facto way of working across oh, wow. the organization and that's like you know a very iterative cycles that's like the squad kind of process and once we know enough about the organization through those kind of projects then we can move back into like the fail safe work mm. of like oh yeah now we can start to think about organizational structure in a very intelligent way because we have an understanding of how the organization actually behaves and where power lives and like how work actually gets done and not just what look what it looks like on paper yeah um and we're just always coordinating between those at the same time. We're like working with leadership and trying to unblock the work and trying to understand like, you know, new issues are constantly being thrown at the organization. Like, you know, the board wants something different. New exec, you know, the executive went to that airport, read that book. Like there's always change being thrown at the process. Yeah. So you're like, you're, you're spinning plates while someone's throwing fire at you. Well, I mean, to be honest, that sounds like most TA teams I've ever been engaged with, where it feels like the demand increases, uh, you got more and more clients yelling at you, demanding more and more, yep. your resources are probably flatlining, if not completely shrinking at the moment. Uh, there's this specter of, well, we'll just go to an agency if we don't like what we're getting, where you're like, well, that means loss of headcount, that means that's bad news. And you're always getting thrown these new challenges. Oh, by the way, we're opening up this new office in Detroit. We have no presence in Detroit. Go hire 400 people. And you're like, ah, what do I do? How do you grapple 
on a regular basis with that much kind of chaos? And, and how is an organizational structured to take advantage of that? One, structure almost has nothing to do with it. Like people okay. often think about structure as like a thing that can solve a lot of problems. And my very first reaction is like structure can only solve like very few problems. Like structure can help you understand like what's my role, who do I report to, um, you know, it, it doesn't solve a lot of like the day-to-day -day situations. And, and frankly, like I believe structure should be like very fucking boring and like you should innovate everywhere, but structure. And every year, like McKinsey or someone else roll out a new organizational structure. And all it is, is like a matrix turned on its side. Like yeah. Spotify did that. It's like, Oh, it's just, that's a squad for matrix. Um, when it comes to like how you deal with the constant froth that organizations are throwing, especially like support teams like TA, that's when, you know, I look at it in two ways. Like one, having that you have to have like such clear outcomes that you are trying to, to chase after. And we live in just a world of like, we are just addicted to doing too many things. And we are addicted to like overloading ourselves and pretending as if we can get 35 things done and that we can manage those things. I mean, look at how we consume media. Like it's yeah. just, it's infiltrated everything that we do. And I, and I think that, you know, I'm, I'm always carrying the flag of like, simplify, simplify, like keep work in progress, really, really limited and have clear outcomes. But on the other side of that, especially for support teams like TA or like HR, like OD is like, you have to be very strong negotiators and persuaders inside the organization. You have to be deft political players. Yeah. And like, we don't talk about that enough. Like, agree. Like we, if you think that politics is icky, you shouldn't be in a support role. Like you just shouldn't like yeah. you're, you're not, you shouldn't be there. Politics isn't icky. Like there's no such thing as a, like a, a like a, a non-political environment. Like people are going to fill that space. Like you've got to step into it and you've got to be willing to like argue and persuade and negotiate and like leverage uh, for the right outcomes. Right. Yeah, and you can right. check in with yourself and be like, am I being a toxic person for those? And like, no, no, like I'm not putting my own interests above like the outcomes that we're trying to seek together, but like you shouldn't be in those roles if you can't play politics. Yeah. If you're, if you're a salesperson and you can point to a big pile of money, politics kind of gets negated. It's okay. Who's got the biggest pile of money? Simple as that. When your job is to say, how do I bring in talent, which is hard to measure, uh, hard to quantify. Um, you know, the, the company does a pretty poor job valuing it anyway. You kind of have to say, how do I build networks? How do I build advocates? And how do I build you know, my own informal resources so I can maintain this kind of level of work? Yeah. And there's, there's like different ways to, to play politics that, you know, and again, like I, whenever I say this, I know I like, I'm I make like 50% of people incredibly upset and queasy, but there's like different ways to play it. You can find your own version of it. At, at, at the end of the day, it's just, you know, it's working together with others. It's leading others. It's a form of leadership, but you have to find your version of it. Um, it's just so, so important to do in those roles. Yeah. I mean, organizations are groupings of people to solve a particular problem. That's, that's all a business is. That's all an organization is. Yep. If you don't work well with people, you don't fit and it, you don't, won't get things done. Well, I just like, just sadly, I hate to, you know, the good work rarely ever speaks for itself. And it's like, it's, it's often not because of some nefarious reason. It's just because people are incredibly busy and our attention spans are incredibly short and, you know, you have to advocate for your own good work and for the good work of people around you and for the outcomes that you know are, that are important. Yeah. The point or the purpose of employer brand is to help people choose your company as a place to work over other companies. Now put that way, suddenly employer brand doesn't seem so complicated. It doesn't seem so crazy. And it seems like something your company could take advantage of. And it is. Take a look at employerbrand.ing, employerbrand.ing, or employer branding, and you can find hundreds of resources, either free or dirt cheap, to help you understand what employer brand really is, how it really works, how to measure it, how to value it, how to talk about it, how to sell it to your boss. So check out employerbrand.ing for all sorts of employer brand resources to help you take advantage of your company's employer brand. So 
you've talked about how you're creating change by developing advocates, identifying stakeholders, giving them sometimes uh, devil's advocate level kind of tasks to accomplish to make them feel included. Yeah. A lot of times in TA, it feels like it's a, it's one person invading you know a country, right? It feels like one person who is trying to pick up this banner and make this change happen. Can one person create change? And if so, what advice would you give someone who's trying to make that change? One person can't. I hate to be I'm just going to be like, just say it. One person can't, but one person can start a change, right? One person can like start to rally others, but one person alone, I guess, un you know, unless you're detonating things, unless you're like just a truly chaotic creature, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're just unplugging all the servers, you know? <laughs> They're just like you're a saboteur. The Homer Otherwise, you have to the soda on the console situation. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, like one person can cause chaos. It take unfortunately, it takes a lot of people to create positive change. That's the world. That's it's like I don't know. Like to go macro for a second. Like that's kind of the sad reality of the world that we live in. Like it's just it's way easier to destroy than it is to create. It takes a lot of coalition building to create positive change together and. The, it goes back to everything I was talking about, about learning to like understand others' goals, others' needs. And like, and it ha may have nothing to do with what you're trying to accomplish, right? Like if you're in, like, if you're in talent acquisition, you have your own goals of what you're trying to achieve. The person you're working with may share none of those and their interests may lay like, nothing that it may not be relevant at all, but yeah. they, you know, they're probably focused on like their own career advancement and you may have to figure out a way to like help them on that journey. And it has nothing to do with your role. And it's about developing your own social network around them and working with them and like helping them have that introduction to a leader that they don't know or something like that. Like it's just, it's, you know, it requires you to, to do that. And oftentimes it also means like, sadly, like doing work for them. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, there's just a lot of like small things that you have to do to like build that coalition of people together and then get them together and activate them. But no, like sadly, one person can't make a positive change. Yeah. I've told other like employer brand specialists, like, look, if you want to start a parade, which is kind of what employer brand is trying to do ultimately, right? if you grab the big drum and you stand on the street waiting for people to line up behind you, you're going to stand there for a very long time. But if you start banging the drum and marching a couple blocks later, you'll turn back and you'll see one or two people and three or four blocks later, you'll see 20 people. And then it forms. Yeah. And it's the action of trying to do things and sometimes failing is what attracts and finds those, you know, it's, it's the dog whistle to people who also want to create a similar change. And that's how you can build that coalition. Okay. Well, yeah, if I, if I go back to, to use your metaphor and I go back to my, my early days of working in the, the first form of the social internet, not only do you get your drum and start banging it, you've actually paid the first five people to join you and, and no one else knows it, <laughs> right? Like you have to have persuaded them in some extremely motivating way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it kind of belies that the, the video that is it Cynic who shows it about how how you start a movement. It's the second person dancing. It's like yeah, yeah okay, okay. That, that that that's 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 some work. That takes a lot more work than you think. Yeah, free uh, drugs. Yeah, it's that, it's, it's that video. <laughs> Hold on, let me hit the button that says mark that 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 what you just said as clearly the clip we're going to share out to everybody. It's free drugs. <laughs> that is how you create change. Yeah. Apparently, uh, it can't hurt. Can't hurt. Um, so. <sighs> My experience, and honestly, the whole reason this podcast is this, is because there is a in a baked in kind of resistance to change in talent acquisition. Um, we hear the same challenges over and over again. We get the com same complaints over and over again. We hear the same, well, why don't we do this? And ultimately, what we change is let's buy a new bot, let's buy a new piece of software, and hope it goes away. And it doesn't seem to. I've seen firsthand, and this always blows my mind. I was in a company. They brought in a new TA leader and I saw a recruiter saying, I don't have to listen to her. She's never been a recruiter before. There is such a kind of like, if you haven't done what I've done, I don't have to engage with you. And I think that's, I've never seen it so clear as in talent acquisition. So I think there's clearly a resistance to change. So, you know, have you worked with TA teams in the past? How do you kind of get them to buy into this idea that change isn't just good for its own sake? It actually can serve them and their own kind of needs and desires and outcomes that they're looking for? Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question. We've worked with them before. And also, you know, for a later interview with you, like Jane Garza at, um, at Etsy is a great person to talk to. She worked at Novell. She's like one of the smartest people I've ever met. 
a lot, a lot of smarts there. She might completely disagree with what I'm about to say too, which is fun. I, I, trust I mean, me, obviously, people, like people disagree with me all the time. That's why I go, okay, at least I'm saying something interesting. So there's that. Yeah. Well, I mean, like obviously, there's a lot of structural barriers in place that, that make change really, really tough in that role, which is the process itself is pretty straightforward. In like in the way that we hire people, there's not like a huge amount of innovation that's going to come out of that, right? Like imagine meeting someone, right? Like there's there's a series of steps that like we're not going to somehow radically change in terms of like how we meet someone, how we vet them, how we offer them the job. There's like there's also legal steps required there. There's then there's the like stakeholder management that we're constantly doing in that role. And there's the like insane level of urgency that you're always trying to parse of like how bullshit is this urgency? But OK, like you needed this role yesterday. Why is it so urgent? And then there's the the discernment of the role itself, which is always the most complicating part of it. You're like, you seem so sure of yourself of who you need. And then I got you 12 people who fit that role and this isn't who you need. Yeah. Right. Like I think to, like, you know, I'm, I'm from Texas. So sorry to like, to echo something my parents would say, it's like the truth too, just about like hiring in general is like, we can't find our ass with both hands. Like it's so difficult to understand who we need and how to find those people and how to assess those people. And like, we just don't admit that in, in the process, right? Like we don't start with a basic admission of like, I don't know yet exactly who I need. And the, the person in the TA side being like, and we have, like, we are still finding our way of trying to understand like how to actually bet on people. Mm -hmm. And if we took it in that way, I think that we'd, be more focused on sort of like hypothesis generation. We'd maybe slow down in the hiring process itself, or we'd do more sort of like a B testing, which, you know, again, like we've worked with some TA teams and like the idea of, of a B testing sounds interesting. No one will ever do it because the urgency of hiring is always like, that's interesting. No, we don't want yeah. to do something like that. Um, like, or we just got to, we got to fill these roles. We have like 15 open roles. Um, and, and also, you know, to be to be somewhat fair to the people who are asking folks in TA to do the hiring, we oftentimes put folks in a role of recruiters who I'm going to be very gentle here. Yeah, I can see I can see the gears turning. Go ahead. Who don't have a ton of life experience? Like we, one of the most one of the most difficult things about trying to hire someone is someone who like runs his own business is like you have to be able to, you're running all these simulations in your head when you're interviewing someone because you're trying to understand, okay, how, they're, how are they presenting themselves? How are they showing up in this meeting? How have they answered questions on an interview form? How are they going to respond to a set of incentives I'm about to give them? How are they going to respond to the people on the team that I'm hiring them into? And you have to have had like, you know, either like a very old soul or a ton of life experiences to be able to model those kind of people in your head. And oftentimes we throw like the most junior people inside an organization into the role of recruiter. And we, uh, we don't give them a lot of development and we set them up to fail. Yeah. And they're trying to just check, check boxes. Like have they had this experience before? And they're trying to minimize risk in their role. And yeah, there's, it's not a good place to put them in. And I think we, we need to address that a bit more. And the people who, you know, have all this urgency, you know, by the time they engage, they get frustrated, but they haven't spent a lot of time up front really trying to define who they're looking for, yeah. um, you know, and, and what the team really needs and how the team's going to respond to that new person. Yeah. On the hire, on the hiring manager side, they've got a day job. They're busy. They've, they're doing stuff. They don't, you know, they, if, even if they know what they want, they don't always know how to communicate it and be clear about it. And then you on the right, on the other side, you've got recruiters who may not know, you know, the technical aspects of what that means. If you're hiring a, a biochemist. Uh, I don't expect a recruiter to understand how mitochondria provides energy in the cell. Like that's, a, you know, I, what are they supposed to do except look at resumes and look at LinkedIn profiles and say, can I check those boxes at least and provide those? And it is, it's a deeply flawed system. I think that makes sense. Yeah. And to have like the deepest level conversations around like, you know, being able to look at a resume, right? There's like the level of check on a resume of of trying to understand and see between the lines of like, okay, what are they hiding and what are they trying to amplify in this resume? And then to have that conversation, the you know, we all know that like in an interview process, the meta questions are where you actually learn the most about people, yeah. and you have to have that level of comfort with the role and with the person and with yourself to be able to go like, so what are you lying about on your resume? Yeah. Or like, how's this conversation going? 
Like, do you, this doesn't feel like a fit to me. Does this feel like a fit to you? Like that is just a different, it's a different challenge in and of itself. Yeah. And all the incentive incentives are poorly aligned and everybody's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a very messy space. Yeah. You're about to say something? No, no, go for it. Okay. So as a business owner who thinks in organizational structures, who thinks in um, how companies get things done, any thoughts on what TA could or should be doing to think about how to be more effective within a business. Obviously, playing the game of politics a bit better, always valuable. But beyond that, how have you seen TA play a, a powerful role in how a business grows? Yeah, I think it's understanding a couple things. Like one is being very aligned to organizational strategy and the kind of fit that you're looking for at the moment and understanding, you know, like we work with clients in different contexts. So whether you're you know, a large, large organization that's actually trying to like re-risk in terms of like moving back towards innovation and trying to understand like what profile is that that you're hiring for and how to hire for that differently. Can you unpack that? Because I think when people in my space hear the word fit, we all go, okay, well, there's a DEI challenge there. That means yeah, white yeah. dudes hire more white dudes. Um, mm -hmm when you say, you know, the profile or the attributes of those people, what, can you give us an idea of what a couple of those attributes or those traits might be that we could look for that kind of cross any kind of DEI challenge challenges? I lost you a bit there. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so I guess the question is, you know, you mentioned traits, profiles, you know, uh, you know, how people do things and are there, can you give us a couple of examples of certain kind of traits that span and go across kind of demographic you know, leanings? Is it, a, is it just simply yeah. a, a aversion to risk or acceptance of risk or acceptance of, of, of chaos? Or, you know, where would you start? Or what are some good examples of that? Yeah. And I think of, you know, just be, to be really clear in the parts that precisely, I think like fit for strategy is very different than like culture fit. And I even think that like culture fit needs to be parsed even more precisely these days, right? Because I do think that, you know, to be somewhat controversial, I think we over gripped on culture fit to some degree of pushing back on it. I do think that organizations need some degree of understanding who thrives in their culture and needs to like understand like, is that creating homogeneity or not? But then there's like a degree of, are we inviting, how is the organization going to metabolize like who we're bringing into the organization and who's going to really thrive here and are they set up for success and what do we need to do? But I think when I'm talking strategy fit, I'm thinking about like contextually, where's the organization in the market and what are they trying to do right now? And I'm thinking about like curiosity and creativity or, you know, or like resilience and really dialing up for those and thinking about hiring profiles differently and not just like, do you have the functional expertise or have you held this role before? Or do you have years of experience? Like all those things that you know that, you know, that people are doing a parse for the, the resume for like, how do we start to change? Like I, I found Tyler Cohen's book on talent. There's a lot of ideas there that I don't love and perspectives, but I think there's a push there to think about the interview process differently to try to provoke sort of meta discussion around creativity and try to get people to, to think differently about like, again, like those meta questions of like two thirds of the, of the way into the interview, asking the question of like, how do you think this is going? Asking questions about like media or creativity, just trying to understand like, what are they bringing into the organization? I think aligning that to wherever the organizational context is, is really helpful and not just sort of like what the exact role definition is that yeah. I'm trying to hire for. So, you know, microbiologist in a scaling company and a, you know, in a, in a company that needs to become more innovative, what does that really look like? What do we mm -hmm. need at those different stages? Yeah. And Tyler Cowen's a great example of someone who I go, yeah, maybe 50% of that stuff I agree with, but I am thrilled that there's someone kind of going, have we thought about this? Here's a completely different and orthogonal kind of approach to whatever the, the, the common knowledge or the common wisdom is. I just, I just pointed out that book that, you know, we still have so much to learn about how we hire and who we hire and our efficacy of our hiring and it's incredibly difficult. I mean, it's like, look at our own personal lives, right? Like we're bet it's betting. I, I love talent acquisition as a title. I mean, it's like, it's betting on people mm -hmm. is what we're doing. And we're like, we're poor gamblers. <laughs> yeah. What percentage of people have been divorced and what percentage have been divorced more than once? And you're like, okay, now make a life changing choice. Uh, we may not have all the information. We may not have all the right, right. processes. Right. Uh, okay. So as we close up, um, 
do you have a challenge you could give from, you know, from your perspective of how organizations grow, develop, change, how they can achieve more? Is there a challenge you can give the listeners what they could be doing to be more effective? I, I think I go back to simplifying. Like, I think all of us are overloaded with the amount of change that we're trying to create at the same time. I think there's recent research that showed pre-pandemic, like most large organizations were doing like five to seven large changes at the same time. Post-pandemic, it's Unreal. 10 to 20. Unbelievable. Um, and some of that is, you know, is necessary. It was caused by the environment that we were in, but there's just so much work in progress. I would say to try to get laser focused on the clear outcomes that you're trying to produce in your organization. And again, down to those observable behaviors, we were working with a client and they've been talking about, we need to empower teams. They've been talking about that for like the last four years inside their organization. We want to empower our teams, empower teams. And that word has become polarizing. Like some people use it as a prop against others of like, you know, I don't feel that, that empowered right now. Other people, it's like they're pure, like anytime they hear it, they just check out of the meeting. They're like, I'm tired of hearing that word. What does it mean? And we were working with their leadership team and we're like, let's just, ba let's just like boil that down into clear behaviors. Mm -hmm. And like, and like one really specific behavior came out of that was like, okay, if we have empowered teams and what we won't see anymore is the executive team dictating product roadmaps. Like mm -hmm. they will no longer decide what team ship. And I was like, that is our definition of success. Let's sit and like, let's peg it on like six months from now. So what needs to happen so that like the executive team doesn't weigh in on the product roadmap and like, oh, it's these five things. Like they need to have trust in the team and trust looks like this. They will have to know that like, we'll have to have like some sense of ROI, but you know, like it built out that list of like what would ha have to happen. And we're like, let's just chase that. Yeah. That's the one behavior we want to see. That's like the, the cornerstone behavior that will tell us like, are we empowering teams or not? And that became a rallying cry for them. Instead of this like amorphous target, which is like one of 12 things on a PowerPoint slide, let's get down to one thing that we wanna chase. Let's get down to a really clear outcome and let's, you know, let's change all those skeptics minds about what we can do together. Yeah, it's that that idea of simplification is that Bruce Lee line of I, I'm more scared of the person who practices one kick 10,000 times than 10,000 kicks one times, which honestly is so many businesses, it's terrifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're all lost. We just have no idea what is our priority at any given moment and oh what we goodness, should be focusing yeah. on. And yeah. and it creates the like, you know, the constant switch tasking and confusion and meetings and like, you know, why we all seem disengaged and you know, let's 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 do each other a big favor and focus. Yeah, I love that. But thank you so much for being here. Uh, if people are interested in what you do or Noble, um, how can they find you? How can they track you down? How can they reach out to you? nobl.io is, is the quickest, fastest way to find us. And I, I'm going to vouch the newsletter is fantastic. It is, um, I, aside from being like every other newsletter, a Sunday read, like every, like my inbox just explodes every Sunday. It's crazy. Uh, it is absolutely <laughs> one I look forward to. And, and thank you for doing it later in the day, at least. It's like, it's not clustered in that 8 a.m. Like everybody shows up in my inbox. Oh, uh, but, I appreciate that. but it's, no, it is, it is, it is a really good uh, thought starter for, how you should be thinking about the bigger picture at work. It's a great new newsletter. Well, thanks again. Thanks for that. And thanks for, um, this is fun. Well, thanks. Keep going. I, no, I appreciate this uh, so much. And hopefully this is kind of expanding everybody's conversation. So, but thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for wasting your time with me. I really do appreciate it. So uh, thanks for being here. Thanks, James. <laughs>